Hi there, Linescapers. This time we sat down with Professor Daniel Rö from the University of British Columbia in Vancouver to talk about drawing and the role of drawing in design and in teaching. He brought a lot of valuable information in this talk. It's a longer format because we think it gives a lot of value to you as a viewer and we would like to hear your thoughts about it. So let us know if you like this kind of videos and not to miss any in the future, remember to subscribe with the bell. Enjoy the video. All right. So, um, welcome, Daniel. This is going to be our first talk, first of the Lionscapes um, podcasts, and we're really glad to have you here. So, Daniel is uh, a landscape architect and associate professor at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver, also award-winning landscape architect, and also does a lot of drawing. So. That's what we definitely wanted to talk to him. And yeah, thanks for doing this with us. It's a pleasure to do that. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Um, Daniel, could you uh, tell us something about yourself, about your career path? I'm a landscape architect. I was trained in Britain and um, I, first as a, a gardener and then as a horticulturalist. And then I trained as a landscape architect in Edinburgh at the university there. And then I worked for many years in Japan and Berlin, where I was in charge of uh, as the project landscape architect of the Potsdamer Platz for the, the Renzo Piano master plan execution uh, for the office Krüger and Merle at the time. And then I had my own office in Berlin for a few years and in Shanghai. And then I was, I was appointed professor in 2006 at the University of British Columbia and um, was a tenure track position and I'm now tenured as an associate professor there. And, um, and I think one thing which has been a very prominent in all my career was the hand drawing. Uh, since my father was an artist and a stained glass window painter and my mother had an art gallery, I had always the influence of my parents, obviously in that sense. But I always used the drawing as a tool, as a communication tool, particularly when I worked in Japan and in China where I didn't speak the language. Yeah. I used the drawing, uh, particularly analytical drawing, not just referential drawing, to communicate the ideas right. I had. Yeah, I can imagine it. And working in a foreign country, basically drawing is universal, universal language. That's right, because if you can't, if you can't speak the language in a really refined way, it's very difficult, particularly in architecture and landscape architecture, to express technical, complex details. And with drawing, uh, hand drawing, quick hand drawing, I learned that in Japan because. When I came to Japan, I was intended to stay there for three months. But then I stayed for nearly three years, opened up a landscape de uh, architecture department in the firm I worked for. It was an architecture firm, Taisei Corporation. There were 16,000 architects and engineers, but they didn't have landscape architecture. So part of my job was over the three years working there to entice the people there to um, accept um, landscape architecture as part of the design process. And so a lot of the work I did was communicate concepts through drawing. Basically, I had a roll of tra yellow tracing paper, which was hip at the time, mm -hmm. and drew all day. Wow. All day. And I got paid for it. So that was a very luxurious position. But I realized uh, that I couldn't get licensed because I didn't speak Japanese well enough to be a licensed architect or landscape architect there. So I came back to Berlin to get my license here in Berlin at the time. How did you originally get into landscape architecture? It's a very good question. Like Cornelia Han Oberland, a very famous landscape architect in uh, Vancouver, I, I, she said she started that with 12. And it was the same with me. I was um, digging in the courtyard of our, our apartment house. We lived in Munich and my mother shouted out of the window while I was digging a pond, maybe one day you will be a landscape architect. And I was very young and the word Landschaftsarchitekt is very long. But I kept with me and I also liked science, biology, horticulture, botany and drawing. And that, then she thought this may be a good uh, fit for me. And then also when I was about 13, she suggested the po pocket money was reduced and I had to work on the weekends in a garden center and work very known garden center in Munich to learn about plants. And so I got into the profession quite early. Yeah. Since it was about 12. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, I can 
you know what landscape architecture is as well. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I learned it through doing it, you know, actually practicing it. Yeah. And I did little drawings of the pond and the form. Wow, really? Yeah, yeah. It's quite crazy. Yeah, I have some drawings. Um, when I went to gardening college in Ed, uh, near St. Andrews, um, at a gardening college, uh, which was about plants and maintenance and greenkeeping for course, golf courses. And, they, and then in the evenings, I always did little, these little sketches. I should show them to you sometimes. I still have them, you know. Oh, I have to photograph them. It's quite cute. And so I, yeah. actually, I should show them to you because it sure. would show the students. Yeah. We all start very simple, you know. It's yes. not like we're all like masters. It's to be a good designer, particularly to be a good drawer, it's practice like if you play the piano or play tennis if you don't do it every day you will lose that so there is the skill and the intellectual yeah. transfer of that skill into thinking as a process but if you don't if you don't train your skill constantly so i don't drive very much and if i don't drive very much and then have to use shift gears again it's quite hard for me at the beginning because i don't do it every day so it's the same with drawing you have to constantly do it you should also put it on Instagram. I mean, it's also something that would be interesting for your other viewers. Yes, that's true. Uh, I have actually put one drawing and it it, it's sort of a postmodernist water feature from the 1980s and I found this yellow tracing paper and I used the filter to make it look afresh and if you it's on my Instagram quite early it's this funky kind of water feature with water dripping from one little bowl to another one and it just reminded me I have to put more on I have a lot <laughs> yeah. all drawn by rotring pen of course of you know course by which is pen. yeah which is very restrictive because it's a technical yeah. tool I should have um, when I was at a gardening college they weren't there was some art t teachers, but they weren't that rigorous in teaching us the different media we could use and the different pens and so on. So I'd learned that through the process. So it was all with a rotating pen, which is not good at the beginning because it makes you scared to make mistakes with well, with a soft um, 6B pencil. You are yeah. much more creative. But it's also a scary tool, right? Because you need to wash it regularly you need to really be you need to take care of rotting that's pen. right yeah. it, a constant just, ceremony know, just leave it there and say okay i'm done you need to really take care of everything yeah and i remember when it was in edinburgh it was so cold in my apartment because at the time in the 80s i had no money and <laughs> the little spiral glowing heating where you had to put coins in every morning the road from pangs were frozen and clogged <laughs> so it was a whole ceremony every day to clean I them all the yeah it was so cold in my nice in my middle you know in the digs and yeah. we call it digs in scottish in my little room in, in scotland Wow. I was just there this summer again in June, and I couldn't couldn't. Remember. It was just so primitive, so because I didn't have very much money at the time. Yeah. Things have changed, but in the eighties, um, I had a coin meter. Same for the shower. So after a few minutes, the shower was finished. So you had to put coins in yeah. to be able to, to heat to heat yeah. to, to draw with yeah. your. Work so it was just crazy, and so with that intention in mind, you you value your time. So I had to be very efficient. Yeah. Wow. So it was it's cold, it's very cold. Mm -hmm. yeah. But I think the most important is to be positive about drawing and not be scared about it. So um, if I think back, you know, I saw these masters drawings, you know, in museums as a child with my parents. And I said, I, I never could do this. And it was not trying to be the same as these people, but I, I was very eager to learn this. It was just like, you know, you see somebody playing the guitar or the e-guitar or any guitar very exciting and you you just it entices you maybe to learn that yourself so in my, in my case it wasn't a musical instrument it was i wanted to be really and i had this intention when i was in japan to be a good fast draw not about um you know the representation wasn't that important but to use the drawing as a tool for design and communicating my ideas to my colleagues in japan and the and the client if you would compare yourself with the students or professionals in japan at that day did you saw any difference? Yes, they, they did very technical drawing and they loved it because they, they were told by their bosses to be, you know, you drawing this technical drawing, they had to do these working drawings all the time and diagramming. And I actually gave drawing classes in, that's how I started teaching. I taught while I was in Tokyo, the staff to, to draw because they, they could draw technically, but not lose and, you know, conceptual ideas. Mm -hmm. And that, while I was doing these courses every week, I realized I actually enjoyed doing them. Mm. But at the beginning, it was very unorganized. I couldn't speak Japanese. So I had to draw also the way I, instead of talking, 
I drew literally everything. And I do that now with the iPad, but at the time there was no iPad. So I drew on the, on the blackboard um, because I couldn't speak Japanese well enough. And then I expressed my ideas through all my teachings, or my ideas how, how I would go about the drawings through drawing it. And, um, and I think that's a very good way. And now with the iPad, we have the power. Um, you basically, instead of talking the theory through a perspectival, how do you draw a perspective, one point perspective, you just do it really slowly on the iPad and you can then go back. You know, you just go back if the students don't understand and say, well, we do it again. Wow. And that works very well. Yeah. So after Japan, then you moved back to Berlin because you wanted to get Yes, I worked. Life, yes, right? I wanted to come back here because I felt I was homesick. I was abroad for more than 10 years and I came to Berlin. It was in, in 92, 93. And the city was amazing. It was booming. The, the demand of architects who were needed. And I came here and then I worked for one year in an office which had a lot of very big projects but I didn't like the office and after a year I said I'm going to quit, I'm going to leave Germany and my father suggested do a year in that office and then go abroad to America, do a little trip, see all your buddies and friends because I'd worked during my studies in, um, for a very known landscape architect Mead Palmer in, in Virginia and so I went to see him and he was already in his late 80s and so that was a really inspiring trip for three months and then I uh, came back and then Krüger and Merle, the office from Stuttgart hired me um, to do a big play area in Berlin in Hellersdorf okay. and uh, it was a huge play thing and it was needed for my licensure. I needed to do Bauleitung or site supervision and then while I was in the office in that first year we got the Potsdamer Platz contract for the green roofs. Which is the very and then there's project. some very important project yeah. at the time because it was about stormwater management and reusing the water. And, and Herbert Dreisaitl, who's famous for the water features, he did design with Renzo Piano the water features, and we did the, the green roofs. And, the, um, and so there, there was a relation. So it was the first project, we call that LID, low impact design, where we reused the water, we cleaned it under the Marlene Dietrich Platz or yeah. Plaza. And then that water was used for the artificial lake, which was designed by Renzo Piano at the time. So we're very, very prominent, and that, that's what then my research went into after at, uh, at UBC now, doing green roof research on stormwater management or Ringwasserwirtschaft, we would say in Germany. So this project's also with other big names there. Yeah, it was Piano. fascinating. So Renzo Piano, I, met, met, I drew, I met them all personally in some of the meetings, and it, uh, Renzo Piano is an amazing sketcher. Uh, so is Richard Rogers yeah. and his partners. They are all fascinating um, I was very honored to work with these very important uh, architects you know Rafael Moneo, Renzo Piano, Lauba and Vera, um, uh, Professor Kolhoff also who did the high rise so there were some really interesting people and so I learned a lot also how to communicate because the project was the first project in English completely and the first project completely digital and because the programs weren't working so well then it took sometimes a night to send a drawing maybe to London and then uh, and another night to send it back to do changes. So we can't imagine today how. Um, so it was the onset of the basically it's CAD digital age. Yes, and then, age. yes, in starting of the digital age, we had to buy these computers suddenly. And I, I learned that Krüger and Möller still with a hand. My bosses both liked to work by drawing. And um, Bernd Krüger was really good at hand drawing too. He had this really fascinating time. They were very um, interesting architects in the, in the 80s in Stuttgart and around. And so they, they did some prominent work there. And then we had to introduce the AutoCAD uh, for this project, but it was fascinating that each office in the world had different um, systems. So the Schnittstelle, so that sometimes when we send a drawing, the, the, the fonts were much too big, the, the, the letters and the numbers, oh, yeah. so everything exploded. So we had to redo a lot of the things and then the different layers uh, to get the layers all aligned with each other. That took quite a while, but it's all drawing. It had all, but it was technical drawing. And, but on the Potsdamer Platz, I, and I'm uploading all my drawings from the ideas. Yeah. All the ideas were still drawn by hand and the master plan was on a base by AutoCAD base and I, we didn't have enough time because we hadn't learned how to use the AutoCAD. I drew in with a rotating pen into the paper print, really? the original. So the original is actually hand colored and everything, but it looks like it's kind of computer and that's what made it really interesting. Wow. I, ha I should show you this. Yeah, I have that somewhere.
Just let me, I can, if I find it, I will give it to you. You just mentioned you're uploading this stuff on the internet. So you have this um, also blog. Yeah. Um, what is it called again? It's called, so I have two things. I have the, uh, uh, I have a drawing blog and uh, which is relate, uh, connected to my Instagram account, yeah. which is called Daniel Red Drawings. And there you can click onto my drawing blog, which um, I think is called, C um, uh, what is uh, off screen studio. studio? Yeah, I have different things, so I have to not get them all muddled up because I have two blogs one for my research lab for scientific work, and you're totally right, it's called off screen studio. And then this one so the idea with the Instagram was actually to lead to f as a feeder for the people to lead in mm -hmm. to look at the uh, blog entries because it's a blog for UBC, I have switched off comments because um, maybe I should put that on, but you never know. People can leave comments, but I have to p permit them to be yeah. to see to see them. Uh, and it's really interesting. What I found is I don't have time every weekend to do a write up, but I've done some and and the people who I um, send to look at this, they do look at it. But what I'm finding is that the people are staying mostly look just at Instagram because it's such a fast moving thing. Um, and also when I upload one image a day, um, and then it goes, you get the likes very quickly. And then in a, because of now I'm in Germany, but when I'm in, in Canada and the nine hours later, all that happens because a lot of my followers, former students are obviously there. And then in a day or so it dies down. And, and, but the idea was, the intention was that that is just to, in, to introduce the blog. But what I'm finding is actually that the Instagram is much more dynamic. And I'm currently writing a paper with a historian who is doing a master's with us. He's already got a master's in history, a historian on how the likes, uh, why do certain p images get or pictures or drawings get more likes than others? And we've been doing quite a lot of research. So we're currently writing this article. What, why, why do certain people judge certain images? And what I'm finding is that the more realistic images, the most boldest, yeah. funny enough, drawn with an iPad with a soft pen, because the iPad now you can do everything. Yeah. You can do like 2B, H, all you can do any kind of um, quality of pencil. And they, the, the more bolder and more simple the landscape drawings, for example, also realistic landscapes drawings are getting a high hit. Yeah. While um, if I write, um, you know, two or three drawings behind where I show the process, how a project developed, some of them they like. And if it gets complicated and I start annotating the drawings, it's even less likes most of the time. Wow. So the more simple, and when you go back on the Instagram, you will see the, you can see it that that, um, that that the boldest drawings seem to attract the most likes. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting information also for us. We are also looking always at this reaction, which drawings get the most attention. Because it's also an important question. It gives a little bit of feedback. If you use drawing as a communication tool, what you know draws the eye? Yes. yes. And your color obviously usually yes. does a lot. Color less. does a lot. Or boldness of the darkness of yeah. the uh, yeah, the yeah. contrast contrast, contrast. Yeah. And, and what simplicity and idea. simplicity of the idea because as you know it's very fast they sit in a subway somewhere and they go zip 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 they go through their feed every morning and then they are tired and they go uh, yeah, yeah. it's like also a kind of a reaction they obviously a lot of it is personal they know my work or they know me as a professor they've learned from me so there's also a, re a, a personal relationship I have other people also following but it is quite specifically former students who do this. And what I find fascinating, you know, I've only got a mobile phone, a smartphone since last year. I had a mobile phone, it was a Nokia, which is 14 years old before. But um, what I'm finding so fascinating is the power um, of these visualizations um, <coughs> and, the, and the, also the possibilities you have with Instagram. You know, I, I see that a lot of people are using it for, um, for like kind of you know business you okay um, <laughs> are you okay yeah uh, and that it's for business like you know to um, you know to sell products and so on yeah. but i think and this is why i'm doing it all these social media are very useful if they're used wisely it's the same with youtube if it's used for wonderful music like classical music or also for modern contemporary music but if it is used in a, i hate the word smart uh, if it's used in a way that it actually has an impact 
and, and, and creates emotions or some kind of discussion. And I mean, we, we met through Instagram yeah, and I've, I'm meeting Instagram. some right. students now, which I have, they came to my lecture, but I don't know them. And we met through Instagram, they looked at it. So it's a new way of actually finding common ground and it interest. It's just a tool, you know, and yes. you use it um, to... You know, wisely. Yeah. Wisely, it is an amazing tool. Yes. So. Why did you why why did you decide originally to put all your drawings on the internet actually? Yeah, that was a research. So a few students they heard that I had all my archive when I moved to Vancouver in 2006. I closed my office and I had about 10,000 drawings in different por portfolios from them. the diff I kept them all every tracing paper because one day I wanted to teach and I thought it may be useful. And then I was a bit frustrated uh, because I didn't know what to do with it. And then luckily one former staff, um, Bastian, he said, uh, don't throw them away. I was literally wanting to throw them away, take them all. And I put them in the container. And then a year and a half ago, I asked uh, um, a student of mine to help me as a direct study to sort, I sorted them out. And then um, we sorted out about 1,500 drawings and her husband, came and built a flexible studio for two days. He's in the film industry and um, professionally photographed them in, in low and high resolution. So I needed them for my new book. I'm on the five senses. I'm currently starting to write. And I thought that would be a, a good way. So and then while we were doing this, I said I would like to do a blog on talking about my drawings. And she said, why don't you also use Instagram as a feed? And, and you know, all the students were laughing because obviously I had a Nokia phone and I was completely out of date. <laughs> but I thought um, that this may be a good way to um, um, sort of um, jump ahead in, in comparison to a lot of my colleagues and use the drawing, which I in, uh, use that platform to initiate the drawings as an important um, research tool on one hand, but also as a teaching tool and as a communication tool, because we, I'm teaching in Canada where UBC has, I think, one of the highest international student bodies in the world and one of the highest, we, I think we are 85% of the faculty is actually not from Canada. So it's a very international university and, you know, they all have to either speak English or French, but mostly in where we are, it's all, all English. But some of the students not at the beginning may have you know, to find it hard to, to express themselves in English really in detail. So drawing is a good way if they have uh, to, to express it in a different format and then get a good feedback uh, for their, for their, you know, during the teaching so that they learn. So I see the drawing as a language, you know, an international language. So, and when I work, uh, I, I taught a bit in Beijing last year and I used the drawing on the blackboard. I, I can't speak Chinese. So I did all my ideas and it was about scientific, about rainwater management. And I did a little section and animated little drawings to explain what I was, what I meant. And they understood that wow. much better that way. And that was what brought me in that recently and that I'm doing my lectures now on the iPad with the, um, with the animation. Um, button or the movie button, the videoing button. So I press the button and one of my dear colleagues at the, the university always says it's the invisible hand because you just see yeah. the hand drawing and she was fascinated by it and, and also asked me if she could use this in one of her lectures. So that was, I was very honored. And she took it to a lecture she gave in Peru or something like that. So, so I think, and then one student in my seminars, he said, when I teach my green roof seminars, he said, you know, water flows downhill. And, but when you show sections and plants, it's too static. Daniel, how about um, using your animation tools? And he sort of, Jericho, he sort of initiated, you know, do, do these drawings so that you show with a blue, blue pen how water flows through yeah. the different systems from the green roof uh, down to the pipe, the rain pipe downspout, downpipe into a swale or retention area, a uh, rain understands. garden, and everybody understands it. But if I put it with a static section and plan, a lot of the students in the seminar didn't immediately understand it because it's a holistic, complex system. So, and hand drawing is so much faster because if I start using AutoCAD to, of course, you can make amazing movies. Half of the movies are made now on the, com on the green screen and with the computer. But um, hand is so much faster. You do, can do it on the train, on the plane, on your little iPad. And then you have for a presentation, you have it all right there and can explain really complex processes really it, it, with a refined line drawing much easier because actually, as we all know, um, it, it, you know, just the water flow and how the water drains through the soil is a really complex process. But at least you can 
explain the physicality of that to the it's the communication role of the drawing, right? Yes. Yeah. Did you ever consider using new technologies like VR? Um, virtual reality, yes, I had a student a few years ago, she integrated very artistically um, into her master plan, into her project for her thesis. She wanted to use virtual reality in Vancouver to, um, when the people were going around Falls Creek, which is a very beautiful inlet, inlet and, and in the old days when the, before the Europeans came, the indigenous people, it was a very important holy place and they had their little villages along the stretch of this coast and she tried to show through VR to visitors coming to Vancouver in overlays which you could visit at certain spots along this on decks or places wow. to see what it was like before and it was fascinating because she showed the context during the daytime and in the evening when the fires for co cooking the, or, or grilling the fish were on so she was trying to animate that and smell so I, I suggested we need to have smell and and we, you know, so she also integrated smell, so not, not just visual and touch and sound. And so she was one of the first to initiate that. But because we didn't have the tools yet, like Lumion, she drew all that and made amazing diagrams and drawings. Very artistic um, student. Yeah. And that inspired me also partially to write the book on the five senses because of when we design, it's also visual because of the Renaissance, we, you know, where we developed um, on the autographic drawing plan section and elevation and projection in a way to communicate to a client. Of course, in the Gothic period, there was a little layout plan, but all the drawings, uh, the, the, the way how, for, not, not with drawings, but the way, for example, um, columns were built was that the, the stonemason would make one and then his disciples would chisel them all to copy. that, would copy that, or they made a one-to-one -one form of a parapet, how that on a church or a, a gargoyle would look like. And then everybody had to use that one form and make the other 20 mass produced. Mass produced. And, and, and it was really the Renaissance which made us even more visual. And in a detrimental way, we all know that the first thing as a child is touch and not touch with the hands. You put the in the mouth when, you, when you're a very little child. So oral touch is actually the first way of exploration. But now on the hierarchy, we have visualizations of the visual, the eyes at the top and touch or smell at the bottom. But actually, in fact, touch should be at the top because that's how we, as, yeah, very intuitive. Yeah. And, um, and we should be learning from the blind to see and from the numb and death to hear. And we should be respectful uh, also to understand the way they see that. I have a friend whose parents are numb and deaf and he says his parents see much better. And they hear, they hear people approaching depending on what kind of flooring you put down. So if you have concrete, exactly, if you have concrete, it's not working. But if you have wood, the vibrations they can feel. And an architect and a designer from architecture, landscape architecture needs to know those things. And they relate to me to drawing because a lot of the ideas you could communicate in analytical drawings um, through diagrams, which have to be learned, obviously, and through um, not only through diagrams, but it also through um, plan section and elevation and perspectival views at the eye level. So to experience spatially uh, um, what they're not designing. But I think the most important is the process. And when I teach, I'm not so interested in the final product, but how do they get there and that they are enticed to do many, many different ideas and hand drawing. You can in one hour make 10 ideas if you're very creative. While if you're on the computer, yeah. it takes you a long time to do that. But so, so this is how you use um, basically hand drawing in your own work, in your design process. How, what, what kind of role does it play? Maybe I would say that? for me, it's not just a um, design tool. It's, you know, also a relaxation or it's also a tool to um, really get um, uh, you know, some I also play the piano in the evening just to get my mind off something else. But for, for me, it's kind of, you know, people go play golf or tennis. Uh, drawing for me is much more than just the business. And on my account, the Instagram account, I've also integrated recently. So I switched from tracing paper and paper to iPad. And I, I also infiltrate recent drawings I do while I'm traveling and so on, or which what comes to mind and I intentionally or I use the finger on a, a smartphone um, and then I put that drawing in there. Uh, so I use the drawing, um, I use drawing also to experiment and explore different ideas. So for me, it's not just a technical or 
or an analytical or an artistic tool while I'm doing my landscape architectural projects or teach, but it's also a passion in my free time. Okay. Yeah, I think it's really important that to differentiate what you do while you're professional, um, and um, but it's a sort of a, a, there is an sort of interaction between my as being a hobby of drawing and its relationship to being a professional. And I think when I look at most people who are very prominent people who draw, and I see there's some really fascinating, there's another professor in England, she is also drawing regularly beautiful watercolor drawings. Again, very representational, but yeah. wonderful work. So there are others who do this all the time. And now Instagram opens up this amazing, it's, I would call it the biggest visual library in the world, like Google, yes. and if we like it or not, this is the fact. And I think instead of fighting it, if we teach um, to use these tools um, in a really professional way, they are actually very valuable. And I've learned so much what how other people are seeing or how they see themselves, how they see landscape, how they see architecture, by the way they make a photo. Because photo photography is also, as we know, a seeing tool and yes, um, it's, it's a visualization and there's lots of different ways which we're not going to have time but photography and the imagery of on the instagram gives you also this amazing wealth of other um inspirations yeah. which help me then to redraw things so and or draw things myself so also teaches you something back. That's right. You just yes. communicate to the world, you also learn something. Yes, and I get feedback on my drawings. Yeah, they like it, they don't like it, I don't understand what you're drawing. So it's a fascinating, it's a it's been a wonderful experience for me so far. Do you notice that your students think the same way about it? Could you introduce your way of sketching or your technique what you're doing to the students as well? Do they see yes, well? I think they do see it. Um, I mean, some are still scared after because they, I think the biggest challenge for, for students today is um, the, to be patient and the distractions are so enormous from all the different tools we have now to focus on something. When I was a student, there was no, the only thing I had was a, a Walkman and a CD player. Yeah. And that was just to give me some music. But I was very focused until literally every morning while I was a student, to three or four in the morning to draw and redraw and to have the energy and yeah, yeah, to do something five, ten times, to be really persistent, yeah. not just to uh, be satisfied by the first idea. I think that's the biggest challenge for me to instill that passion to students. And drawing can help because it's such a fast, quick tool to really show to a professor or someone you want to show your drawing to get feedback. While if you start, well, I'm going to do a rendering that takes you hours and then maybe the rendering is not really what you're trying to show. So the drawing is so much more flexible. You just need a pen or a stylus. It's so you can do it on any piece of paper. You can even do it in the sand. You can do it on a piece of wood. So that flexibility you have. And I think, um, to, to have the stamina to really do something again is maybe one of the most challenging things of this generation because of the destruction of all the different tools we have now. And this draw, the drawing enables it, right? It's like layer That's upon right. layer, it enables simple repetition, which through small changes then, you know, brings new, yeah. uh, new realizations. Yeah, yeah. No, I think it's an um, extremely important tool uh, and I, I, I know that at, um, at the University of British Columbia, we are now, there's colleagues of mine who also love drawing and um, we are trying to keep this up and the students re requested it. They are all worried about if they don't know all the computer tools that they won't get a job. And I understand all that, you know, now it's getting, now they're taught Rhino and all the modeling tools, which are fascinating. But to but what is much more important is that they generate ideas and hand drawings and hand modeling is really useful and a, and, and a good employer will see and recognize this. Otherwise, they're going to end up as cat monkeys yeah. in a factory. And this is not what I would like my students. They should be leaders. They should be um, inspiring and use the drawing as an inspiring idea generator instead of um, um, being so worried and concerned that they learn a certain computer program because each office has a different 
way how they do their computing and, and the different programs and how things are filed. And that is quite easily learned, but the thinking process and drawing it's, is such an important tool to it's do. It's the that. basic, right? The I most have a important. I it's um, kind of a foundation upon which you learn the other tools. That's right. Because once you know the logic yeah. of drawing, the, the, the logic of thinking through, you know, logic of visual thinking, yeah. then and you, can, you can learn other tools. It's just a matter of, you know, time and investment into the new digital whatever. But yeah, and you both, like me, we all three were very lucky to have professors who could do that. And, and it's wonderful. Um, I mean, you're a different generation than I am, but that you, it still was happening where you're yeah, both from in Ljubljana, because it's fascinating to see that um, that your professor was pushing it and the value now, you can see the value now having your um, Instagram feed with all these followers and also the educational movies. But it has to do, if you didn't have that foundation and that vision by this educator, you may not have had that experience. I was very fortunate that my father was an artist and trained as an art teacher for children before he went into stained glass window, pedagogical. He went to um, Castle at the university, the, the ac academy there. And um, so, I, and it's really fascinating when I was, I just thought about this and I wanted to mention this. When I was a small child, my father never said, you are great, your drawings are great, even though he thought they were quite okay for my age. So when I went to show my dad a little drawing, he said, do another one. Instead of saying, oh, this is really great. So because he said, do another one, it enticed me to do more. Instead of giving me, oh, this is a wonderful drawing, you are little Picasso, or you're doing these amazing abstract yeah. drawings. Uh, instead, he was actually encouraging me to do more. And the whole process to be good at drawing is you have to do lots of it constantly. Yes. It's, it's a skill. skill. And, no then, and then it's like driving a car with the shift gears. And then later, when you know all that, then because you know how to drive the car, you can actually focus on the traffic better. And we all had the driving tests. The beginning, it's quite daunting to do all these tasks but because then when you have learned those basic skills then you can actually focus on the driving or on the drawing being a design tool and to develop ideas and I think this is the challenge that most students who see drawings they're worried oh my god my tree is not looking as good as the tree my teachers drew or if the tree proportion is right and one recognizes it's a tree it's all you need in relation to the human scale of a person, for example, and in perspectival view. And I think we should be much more um, focused on teaching the students to understand it's not about the representation, but what is your drawing actually saying or what is it doing for your project? Or is it in, to explain something to a client and so on to a teacher? And I think this is the biggest challenge to differentiate between representational drawings of an idea to make a representation in a city hall to a group of mayors or clients you have, you need to see or in yes, contrast, in strong yes. contrast, <laughs> or um, an analytical drawing which helps you to teach, for example, about green roofs and yeah. rainwater management, or you need analytical drawings, or drawings which explain it in axonometric or how the water flows, or even animated drawings. So, yeah, could you expand a bit on this analytical drawing? You were. Uh... We talked about it before, yeah. the importance of drawing also not this a tool to com communicate. We talked about it as a tool for design, but also as a tool to understand. Right? That's right. That's right. It's, I think the difference between, and this is the biggest worry that people are worried. And then because of being worried, they are not trying out different drawing techniques because they I feel intimidated that their drawings don't look as good as the teachers. Yeah. How should they? They've been doing that for 20, 30 years. And I think it's really important for the students to understand that drawing, everybody like language. I learned English. I couldn't speak English as a child. So I had to, everything can be learned. What to be a good designer, then that's a totally different kind of story. But if you can learn to draw well, it at least gives you the chance to show your ideas better and then get feedback on your ideas if they are the appropriate ideas for the project you are doing. But if you can't express your ideas and just talk, which a lot of students do, they talk too much. Actually, I try to always tell them when they come into the project in a studio, yes, I'm gonna do this and I'm gonna do that. Instead, I say, well, please, by next week, have something on the paper, I can see it because this is now your new language. And I think the most important 
a most complex and most difficult thing from when they have the first studio, introductory studio, is that they suddenly have to switch from verbal, oral presentation, oral talking, to suddenly actually use the drawing as their new way of communicating an idea with a model, of course, and an oral presentation, but really the drawing or the model or the 3D Rhino model, whatever they're going to use, has, there has to be some kind of drawing to, to help to get a critique or a good feedback on it. And that's, I think, one of the biggest challenges. Yeah. So what would you, what would you advise to your students? How do they start? That's a very good question. I, I think when I teach students um, drawing, I, in the first few uh, weeks, I give them sort of loosening up exercises. So we just draw straight lines because they're worried that the line isn't straight. And, and I say they don't need to be straight. If you can't draw a straight line, then draw it wiggly. Then you can control your pen a bit better. So I do like these sort of pen holding exercises, the different softnesses of the pencil. So we just start with a pencil and paper and nothing else, just different kinds of um, softnesses of the graphite pen, and that's about it. And then uh, after a few um, exercises, I always go outside in the landscape. Hopefully the weather is good. And we look at trees, we look at people, and we draw. We have a very beautiful Japanese garden on campus, one of the best actually outside Japan. Um, at UBC, which was given as a present with a real Japanese tea house. And we go there and we draw in the autumn and we draw the leaves and we draw the trees and the gestures with the little water feature. And then I try to explain to them that this, that the whole garden is a system. There is not just the bridge. There's not just the tree, but the tree has roots and there is a ground where the tree is is sitting on so there's grass around the tree so i'm trying to relate that they don't that the, that the pencil starts flowing from the different parts and it's not that you don't just draw one thing at a time i'm now drawing the tree but you relate the tree to the context where it's positioned that it has a root and if you can't even see the root underground you can show that the tree at the bottom goes wider so that they learn how to see in those simple details and um, yeah, analytically and then start drawing them. And I think that's what I do. So I, I, I'm totally for going outside. It's yeah. a really important. And as you know, a lot of the landscape painters, that's what they went out with their, um, with their whole drawing equipment and their easel and sat and, and drew. So I think that's a really important thing. Do you, do you teach them also to ask the right questions during sketching? Yes, I always ask them, but it has to be through drawing. I want them first to draw something and then not maybe ask. It's a very good question because they can ask a question about how is my drawing, but does it, but I would then say, what are you trying to express with the drawing? Yeah. Is it just, I'm, are you drawing a tree? Or are you drawing the tree, how it's relating to the slope it is planted on in the, in the landscape? Yeah, so, yeah. yes, and so that's a, a yeah. back and forth. It's yeah. totally right. This is a very, very fascinating question because it's about how, how you, um, the questions, like if you have a seminar, a theoretical seminar, obviously the students have read books and papers and then you ask them critical questions and then entice them to ask them each other. What I always also do is critique between the students. So I, after a few weeks, we pin up and the students critique each other what they see in the drawing of their colleagues right. and help each other. Yeah. And by that process, they learn seeing as well. They see, yeah, they, they see orally and yeah. They're yeah. Yeah. And I never correct and I, we do not use erasers. So yeah. Yeah. I say leave everything. And I also think the great thing of a drawing, a real drawing is, and then when you have a drawing there and I say change the form a bit, that they leave the line and then see how the form changes. And pedagogically, instead of when you have a drawing on the computer and you print it, and you want to change it, but then you have five different drawings, but you they're all different, a little bit changed, but you don't see how the form changes on the drawing itself. Yeah. That's why I prefer one drawing where, let's say there's a pond on it, and I say maybe that pond form doesn't fit with the building around it. Can we maybe make this the form of the pond more relating to the you building? The, the yes, overlaid, over overlaid even yeah. on the same paper or the tracing paper, yeah. and you put it there, instead of um, you have five printouts of different ponds, but then they can connect, particularly when you're professional, you can do that. But 
when you learn in the first and second year, pedagogically, it's much better. You see how it changes. Yeah. It's always for us, for our students, we notice the challenge is this fear of the blank page. It's like, oh, it's overwhelming. It's, oh, I have to start. Where do I start? You know, the drawing is not going to be that good. Do you have any tips for students how to overcome something like that? So, yeah, what I normally do is I do these thumbnail exercises. For example, I, I start a line, we sit around the table and then somebody has to continue on that line. And then we, so we do it together. We draw a line together and that line gets a really funky. So, it, so I, I, I start a line and I, and, and I put my hand on that line and then or we put a paper on that line, just show a little bit, and then somebody puts another piece and then the paper again. So we, we, we so it, in a playful way, that's one idea. Or I do line exercises, very simple. Mm -hmm. and, and and then we, it's always intimidating. But it, I've been t teaching hand drawing for so many years and I, I, I always do it, try to make it better because I went to university to be a professor to learn, not to just, Mm -hmm. frontal teaching I want to learn something as well otherwise I would have continued practicing so I'm learning with the students and every year I try to make it better and what I'm learning is you have to also theoretically slowly explain the different kinds of reference what what are the different kinds of drawing so a bit of if I would set up my drawing course new now I would actually start maybe in the first lecture actually explain the differences in the past, I started drawing right away, but then half the class may be intimidated. So it's maybe better if I do this, maybe it happens in the future again, that I have a day where I show drawings and then we discuss them. And then the next day we start oh, yeah. drawing. Because what I'm finding is if you immediately say, let's draw, half the class will freeze with the pen yeah. and it's not good. So maybe I will, or I do these little Exercise. Exercises, yeah, yeah. playful exercises where we draw together or we have a long sheet with a long table yeah. and we all draw together in our own style to nice loosen again. them up because, oh, you know, I can't say let's have a half glass of red wine, but, I mean, you but to, I could, <laughs> but it's uh, not allowed at university, but, uh, but I think I could, yes, at home, but I think it, it, it is really important that they understand the different kinds of drawing and that may help them not to freeze. So in the past, I immediately started drawing, but I would have learned is a lot of them really had problems with that. Yeah. And I think if I taught it again, I would explain more, mm -hmm. maybe in a lecture or two, and then do these little exercises. But then go out very quickly into the landscape like you guys do, and, yeah. and, and, and little sketchbooks, different sizes, and use soft, thicker pens, not the thin pens, pens, so that they're loose. So I would actually ask them to use the big graphite pens like this thick to, to draw, so that the person is really quickly drawn. You know, you just draw like really, if this was a thicker pen and you just do that, and then the, the person is drawn very quickly, instead of them going, oh, and then they worry, and they can't draw, you yeah. know, like that. So it's, I think, that kind of, so, I give them a really thick, I ask them to buy a really thick pen. But I think at the beginning, doing it together is really important. And explaining to them that it is a skill which can be learned. Yes. I think it's, that... It's not mysterious. It's not mysterious. And I use my example of having learned English or something like that. You know, because it's not my first language either. So it is possible to learn. All the, all the books I've read for my second book right now for the research, from the 60s, 70s, 80s, from very prominent um, writers on drawing say it can be learned. It's not just me who's saying it. There's a lot of evidence in the past which already suggests that. So. Yeah. Where can students find you? How can they connect with you? Yeah. How, which can, how can our viewers? Yeah. How, how can oh, um, they can uh, connect through the blog. Uh, they can send me an email. It's very simple. Um, through my email, um, which is D, and then my name, Rohr, R-O-E-H-R, so D for Daniel, R-O-E-H-R, at, is clear, and then Sala, S-A-L-A, -A, School of Landscape Architecture, ah. of Architecture and Landscape Architecture, so I will just repeat it, so it's D Rohr at Sala dot UBC for the University of British Columbia, and then dot C-A. 
but you can put that in, in the there. show notes yeah. and yeah. in the video description so yeah. people can find you. And also then your Instagram account, Daniel. Daniel Rare Drawings, one Daniel word, Drawings. one word. In your blog? And my blog is off screen blog, but it's a UBC off screen blog. I don't know the address right in my hand, but, but I think off screen, if you Google off screen, off screen you, you will know, find it. Find in my name, you will off, find it. But it is, uh, if you go on my Instagram, it's a link is at the yeah. top. Great stuff. We but I, can al I can already, I can also give you the exact address. Yeah, we'll also put it in, in there. And of course, we're very excited then um, for the book that is going to come out. Yeah. In 21, it's by Routledge and it's on the five senses in seeing. And it's also about um, inclusion design. So how do we integrate people who, for example, are blind or who, who uh, um, ha have problems in hearing or speaking? And how do we integrate them in the design process and um, use their knowledge? Actually, maybe we can see better through the way they see. And, and appreciate the other four senses as much as we appreciate the visual visual sense. And I, I absolutely support drawing and autographic drawing and all those. But to be honest, and um, the other four senses are as important, if yes. not more important, actually, to be a good designer. And for that, I did a seminar which is called Seeing Environment 2018, and all the assignments are online on a blog, on a special blogs the students did. So it's called Seeing Environment 2018. And, um, and that is the sort of precursor for that book. It's right. online. You should look at that. Yeah, definitely right. will. Yeah, it's got really fascinating um, assignments on it too, and syllabus. And, and this, it's interesting, a lot of the students were not designers who took the course. And funny enough, they did a lot of really good work too, because they were afraid of the hand drawing. But as soon as the assignments switched to the other senses and drawing wasn't the only medium they were allowed to use, they could use film, podcast, talking, anything, they, collages, they got really, got really interesting. Yeah. Like everyone's visual, right? Yes. So you have yeah. like so many senses. We're too focused on the visual, and um, and as we both, we all three know, if you sit in a chair, which may look good, but if you have to sit in the chair long to work, maybe it's not the right chair to sit in, and um, it may aesthetically look good with the paving or the room. I just saw that in Munich at the Rembrandt exhibition with my mom. She sat down, and and the and the the back was so hard on her back she couldn't sit on that. It looked beautiful the bench, but it was terrible to sit on. So. And that's the sensitivity the students have to learn in design. Too. And you can, this is a seeing thing. You, yes. They need to learn ah, and critique what's out there to make it better. And if you can't see with the five senses, how can you be a better designer? So it, the drawing equips them, the hand drawing, it, and it has been doing this for hundreds of years, equips people to see sharper. But in the combination of, with the other four senses, it will be it's even one of better. The tools. Yeah, it's one of the tools. So. And it's important to, to use yeah. all of them. Yeah. All right. Thanks, Daniel. This was so uh, good? Yeah. really interesting. Good. We wish you a good trip in Berlin. Thank you. Yeah, and hope to see you again soon, guys. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> we hope you enjoyed the video. And please, please leave us a comment below, a feedback, how you like these kind of long form podcast like videos. Um, because we intend to shoot more of them in the future and would love to know how, how they're working for you. We hope you subscribe and ring that bell so that you won't miss any future ones in the future. And yeah. You know what to do. Keep on drawing. And see you next time. <laughs> Bye.